Chief Martin Abbasson. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Many people may look at you and say, who is Chief Martin Abbasson? I have read some say you are an economist. Others, you are a politician, obviously a man of uh, vast knowledge and uh, enterprise. But from yourself, who is Martin Abbas? My name is Kuku. Boy, grew up Catholic, grew up an Ime Kuku, an Oweri, young man. Primary interest is to be the best that I can be. Not for myself, but for humanity. I'm a man who has a deep concern for the welfare of others, especially for the underprivileged, especially those who are locked out of opportunity. That's who I am, a man of courage, a man of honor. Those are the things that are important to me. You mentioned that you were a man of courage. Was that what took you at a very young age that you left the shores of Nigeria? You know, you have um, your sting with uh, uh, Italy and also the United States of America. And while I researched you, you got married at the age of 23. That must be enormous courage because, I mean, not many people get that feat at that young age. I like to explore. I've always liked to explore as a little kid. Actually, where we are, where I'm living now is the way that leads to our stream. The first time I ever went down this road, because it used to be a big forest, I was just 10. I decided I was going to leave my, my home about a kilometer from here, stretching to about three kilometers to the river. I wanted to find out if I would, I would be afraid and if some bad spirits can catch me. That was challenge with fear. I went to the stream, fetched water, came halfway. I felt that wasn't enough. I went back to the stream, took a bath because it was rumored then that there's uh, some mermaid that will show up if you get into the water alone. And I did. The mermaid never showed up. And I came back. I'd like to explore. At 16, I was done with my school certificate, my, my work. I needed to travel abroad. I needed to study abroad. I needed to uh, see totally new environment but most importantly i'd like i wanted to go alone once my father who believed in that courage told me it was okay for me to travel i left and uh, the rest is history was that why i got married to my beautiful wife at 23 i don't have limitations anything i want to do I do, but I'm guided by doing things, one, that are within the law, are within human approved space, within the Catholic approved space, and things that my conscience will clear that are generally overly okay. Once I get that inner approval, nothing scares me. I don't know the meaning of fear. Well, aside, you know, the things you've explained now, where you, how you have uh, exhibited courage, I would want to know, you know, you have three children who are now adults. And um, do they take after such courage that you have? Maybe a lot more, maybe a lot more. They are very independent. They are very self-motivated. They are very driven. My grandson, my first son's best son, 
is a young man also of super courage, has done incred incredible things at 15. So uh, they like their space, my children. They, they, they are independent-minded, as I said, self-driven. They are not limited by any feeling of fear. At least so they say to me, and that is what I have observed. For the things that Martin Abbaso has been doing, if you check, you have multiple touch points. Oil and gas, hospitality industry, agribusiness. Which of these has been the most difficult and most challenging, at the same time, most rewarding? The things that I do, I don't put in capsules. I don't appraise them by rewards or um, what I get at the end of the day. It is the satisfaction that I derive. My farm used to be my 18-hole golf course. And one day at the prompting of my first son, I decided I was going to do something a little bit more profitable. And um, I wanted to build 27 farms when I was preparing to become governor in 2007. I said, wait a minute, since I, I'm trying to do something that would help humanity, create jobs, also uh, provide income, I will do a miniature size of those farms, one of those farms I wanted to do as governor. That's how I started the farm. And every day is extremely rewarding because I I sing I planted everything I have my fingerprints on everything in this farm I we excavated 4.9 million cubic meters of man-made water we're running 2.8 kilometers enough aqua space aqua warehouse for 45 million catfish Full stocking technically makes us the largest catfish farm in Afri Africa. 45 million catfish. catfish. yes. That's the space we have. Going by the spacing for catfish breeding. And um, so e e every day is an eye opener. Every day is a new, you take a new initiative. There's something new to learn. Uh, about aquaculture. There's something new to learn about pilgrim. There's something new to learn about uh, uh, plants, you know, animal husbandry, goats, sheep, how they cohabit. I sit down in the farm, I watch the herd of sheep and uh, see their behavior, their behavioral pattern, separate them from that of goats. I brought in uh, uh, cows from Argentina, bulls from Argentina, to crossbreed with uh, our local cows here. And every day you sit down, you watch uh, the interaction. It's incredible. So uh, for me, the pecuniary consideration here means nothing. You know, what I have learned with my wife uh, we traveled to uh, Argentina, we traveled to Chile, we traveled to uh, Vietnam, Laos, uh, Thailand, Singapore, even to Italy and Israel, you know, looking at different farms before we settled for this. And each country is unique. Each environment is unique. Each product is unique. And um, the, the level of excitement is incredible. So as far as I'm concerned, my in business interest in oil and gas, in maritime, in uh, hospitality, in, um, in construction, I built quite a, a good number of roads in Nigeria. And uh, yes, the beautiful thing is that when I travel on the roads that my company has built and uh, I see they're still holding up 
10 years, 15 years, 20 years going, you have satisfaction from that. But it is the farm because he's breathing, he's living. You know, you develop affection. So there are no, uh, the concern is not how much money I make. Money is, money plays very little role in my life. Very, very little role in my life. Because I know what it means not to have a penny. And I know what, to, what it means to reasonably have plenty of it. And in between, nothing changes. It's all in our heads. So in all you do, your farm gives you the most satisfaction. Yes. Uh, and uh, I am also a task person. If I have a task now in maritime, if I have a task to see how there's a major crisis and uh, something has to happen with cabotage, and the knowledge I have must be deployed in that area, that becomes an interest because I'm task driven. If something is going on in oil and gas, and uh, we have to do some well survey, and there are new gyros that need to be deployed for us to do the survey. That presents a challenge, especially, oh, this has to happen. We have a timeline. We need this done in the next uh, seven days, 14 days, 21 days. That task changes my interest. Basically, you take you know, it, technically looking at it, you uh, you are sort of the person that takes up new challenges every day. I'm restless. Now, would that explain why you didn't? You know, it's not something many knew before you were made special assistant to former president Olusegun Obasanjo on ecology, and it was a task you took up head on. How did you find that? Well, that was an odd ball. I was like a square a square peg in a round hole. I'm, I'm an economist. What I know is how to build economic modules, numbers, you know, uh, econometrics, stuff like that. Uh, I don't know anything about geology. I don't know anything about soil science. And here I was, SA Ecology. Uh, Abba, how would I do this one now? You know? So I asked questions, especially uh, Mr. President. You know, he's an incredibly brilliant man, intensely brilliant man. And uh, he said to me, when you start the job, you will know why. And uh, uh, I think it was quite an interest. I gave him my word what I was going to do, and I'm sure he was happy with what I did. When I, re I attended my resignation, it wasn't very easily and readily accepted, but I had another calling. I had to go. So it was an interesting assignment. If I stay around the time you were given that job to do, within the uh the uh, ecology. If I want to find out, you look at the southeast, for instance, based on our soil topology, we are very prone to um, soil erosion, which obviously fell under the remit that you worked on there. Where would you consider, if I stay within the realm of southeast, that has, from your knowledge, the greatest risk of erosion and what do you think from experience that the people should be doing to avoid such from escalating more? Well, you see, um, the risk of environment 
depletion, environmental depletion is so misunderstood, so undercalculated that people make sweeping statements. Ah, the problem is in, more in Anambra or is in Imo. There are unique uh, problems associated with particular areas at a particular time. The general overview of uh, a, uh, talking about a geographical space, saying that this, uh, if you come to Imo, Idato is the worst hit. But there could be a major washout out of uh, 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 Otamini River that can instantly threaten human uh, habitation or existence in that particular place that makes it an emergency. And the magnitude of that natural occurrence, that environmental degradation in terms of human loss, property loss in monetary terms may outweigh what an area that has been exposed to such problems over time. We have flashpoints in the Southeast. Some that some can be controlled by human intervention. Like in Onitsha, for instance, where people deliberately block all sewage tracks, build on existing conduits. You must have challenges where people burn waste at the risk of major hazard to the residents. Those things can be stopped, but they pose monumental threat to our nature. The washout going towards Obidi, you can't do anything about it. You have to have major, major, major intervention. What you have in Idato requires major intervention. What you have in Injaba requires major intervention. What you have along Obuide uh, requires major intervention. What you have in uh, Umunzi area requires major intervention. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that uh, Anambra has bigger problem than Imo, or Imo has bigger problem. Look at a place like Aba, for instance. If nothing happens, if nothing happens in Aba, in the next two, three years, the place will become uh, a, a major uh, environmental hazard just by people dumping waste uncontrollably. So, in 1992, at a, an you know, age that many will consider very young, you became a senator in Imo State. Uh, that was under... Um, NRC. In 1998, you defeated uh, Chief Iwanyangu in Nemo State to become a senator. Now, you talked about courage at the beginning of this interview. Is that an epitome of courage? Because looking at yourself today and the younger ones, what, you know, again, I, I, I wouldn't keep going back asking where that courage comes from. But how did you do it? Well, I wouldn't call that just courage. It was quest, hunger for success. I was hungry to get to the apogee of my interest, my political effort. That was what, that was the driving force. Of course, you would say that that was propelled by courage because in doing so, I didn't care what happened. I take precaution, but no, no fear. Now, uh, would I do the same thing again? Yes, but a little bit more cautious. I was raised to believe that you can be all you want to be. 
Once you put your mind to it and walk towards it, it's possible. Once you are alive, everything is possible. So it, it was more for quest for success. And I believe that uh, God has also endowed me with some gifts that I'm constantly looking for how to showcase the talent God has endowed me with, to deploy it to the benefit of mankind. That hunger is always there. So if we stay on that hunger, in the period I was researching for this interview, I come across a group called Fix Emo. Now, in reading the content and following that one, it would appear to me that you have that hunger to fix Emo. Then I would say, come the next election, uh, electionary cycle that has to do with Emo State. I would want to ask you, are you running for the governorship of Imo come 2023 that we are in now? Yes, I am. And that hunger, as you alluded to before, is to fix Imo. Then I would say, what is broken in Imo? The hunger has widened. I mean, driving, driving into Imo State, driving to my house, you wouldn't need anybody to tell you there's a need to fix Imo. Imo state used to be the most peaceful state in the country. People used to drive, fly into Imo state every weekend, in fact, from Thursday, to just have a peaceful weekend. But today, 40% of our people can't go back to the ancestral homes. 40% of our people can't move around in their home freely. Today, if you tell 10 people, oh, I'm going to Imo State, it will sound you a strong warning. And that calls for concern. I cause for serious concern. And when we say fix emo, I had spoken to a group of people yesterday and the day before yesterday. My primary concern is not just to fix the infrastructure. Because that's lazy. That's lazy work. That's the least that you can do as governor. Because we only have 987 kilometers of state-owned road network. And if you use competitive bill of quantities, with drains for less than 104 billion, you would have paved every square meter of road to look like inside these premises. We have 1,429 kilometers of local government link roads. And you don't have to pave them. Today, there's technology. You scarify, you surface dress, and mix with road, road design, which is a soil binder that makes it impossible for water to permeate into the earth. And that gives you 15 years of hardness, guaranteed. For less than 20 billion naira, you would have uh, treated all the local government, every square meter of the local government roads in Imo. We have 1,275 primary schools. I'll show you some schools, primary schools in Imo State. They're only schools in Imo State. You won't send your dog into them. Forget about what they say on TV. We have 314 secondary schools. To repair, fix every classroom, build additional 
54 secondary schools with emphasis on science and technology so that we can train our children properly will cost less than 32 billion spread over eight year period four years period we have 215 health centers i'm going to show you what some of the health centers look like the price you just mentioned now is that including or excluding the ubec counterpart counterpart funding mechanism that is overall cost then exposure, you know, there are different accounts. The, Fed, the state government, there are things the state government cannot pay for. That's not the responsibility of the state government that is covered by Jack. But when you have reasonable leadership, you direct the local governments on what to do. Once you have a visionary leader, a leader who is not corrupt, a leader who is determined to do the right thing, you set the right framework, and every part of government will do their bit. Everybody says, oh, we spend this huge amount of money on, on, on our wage bill. We have 16,489 civil servants. 3,419 public servants. As at the last uh, count, 24,532 teachers. So you can't spend 85% of your income, of your receivable, on less than 0.5% of your population. We have major issues with pensions. Gratuity has not been touched in this state in the last 20 years. So morale is very, very low. Low energy in the workforce. It takes leadership to fix all that. But that is not what is, uh, what I consider uh, of major interest to come and fix. We need to build a new economy, development of human capital. We have the largest pool of human resources. We have over one million young men and women roaming the streets, either underemployed or unemployed. And people have different skill sets that we can tap into. We need to retrain our young men and women where they will become employable where they can be independent enough to earn a living, we can open up the economy. People fail because of lack of knowledge. Leaders fail because they have no clue what it is they want to do, how they want to go about it. By the time you identify the problems, know what they are know what created those problems you have gone halfway if you believe in research and development you now understand the solutions look at something like power for instance in emo state what we have is 120 megawatts of power in emo state that's what we get when everything is okay some months will come down to 90 some months will come down to 85 we shed load because the installed capacity is 160. But we can't do 160. The most we can do is 120. There are four transformers we have set up here that are being built. But they've moved away two of the transformers. We have two. The workers had to stop them from taking them away to another place. Maybe when those two transformers are fully built and installed, we'll have 160 capacity filled. So what do I do as governor of Imo State? Am I going to sit down here and suck my thumb and wait to the point that uh, some magic happens? The story of Nigeria and power is solved. No. 
We have 68,000 housing units in Oware North, where you are, for argument's sake. I'm going to put seven generators in Oware North. Am I going to be the one, is Imo State going to be the one paying for it? The answer is no. A private person, Njenje TV, Njenje Media, and the Electrical comes in here, buy seven generators. They range from 650,000 uh, to 1.1 million dollars. That is General Electric, the most expensive. What we can do is give you all the enabling environment and provide warranty for you to work with. You put in five generators here, two backups. Right now, we are getting power sold to Emo citizens at 35 naira per kilowatt unit an hour. That is the cheapest single unit residential. They range from 30, that 35 naira to 96 naira per kilowatt unit an hour, depending on where you live and what kind of uh, 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 commercial structure that you live in. Now, Njenje Media and Electrica put these five generators here. My deal with you is that you are not going to sell to my people at 35 naira. You must sell to us at 20 naira. Even if you have to truck gas from LMA to here, it will cost you less than 10 naira per kilowatt unit an hour. And remember, as long as you have one megawatt and under, you are operating under the NERC regulatory uh, conditions. So you can actually generate and distribute. So, and I'm saying to you, if you if it costs you 10 naira, and you have given my people 15 naira discount, you are making 10 naira profit. So 10 naira times uh, 24 naira, times 68,000. That's a shipload of money. The state government gets paid, uh, I mean, receives some IGR from it. You have 1,000 jobs you have created disposable income in excess of 450 for 80 million naira. And we have uninterrupted power supply in Owere North. It goes to Owere Municipal, Orlo, Idat or not, Idat or Sato, Kigwe, Mbano, everywhere. If you have regular power supply, the average Igbo man, the average Igbo person can germinate on stone. All we need is good roads and power. People who show that we are very productive people. We are the most industrious people on the planet Earth. This is just one action of government. That is the how you were asking me. What does it take to take, look at young men who have just finished school certificate, to train them in agriculture. I sent something to you, cooperative, cooperative schemes, cooperative agricultural scheme, cooperative export scheme. The big deal is no longer oil. The big deal is gas and exports of agricultural products and minerals. We put our young people in cooperative schemes where they collectively do those things they cannot do as individuals because they don't have exposure to capital. In other words, if you produce one ton of cassava starch, you produce 10 tons of cassava starch, you produce five tons, you cannot export in these quantities. 20 of us come together and go to Fidelity Bank and say, listen, Madam Fidelity Bank, we have a cooperative. We can export cassava. Where is your export desk? They show you the export desk. Because we have put this thing together, Fidelity Bank will guide us to put our... Uh, 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 25 tons of cassava starch and show us how to export it to Italy. We do the first one, proceeds come back, we share it according to what we contributed. We do it for one year. Each and every one of us who didn't have access to capital, who didn't have access to banking, who are like dead non-existent people, now have a record with the bank. You can now go back to the bank and say, uh, Mr. Fidelity Bank, 
you know I've been working with this cooperative for the past uh, one year and a half. I started with one ton of five, uh, uh, 500 kg by shipment. Now I am doing six tons or I'm doing 10 tons. However, I want to do on my own. Can you avail me of money for 10 tons? I have money for six tons. So you have your independence, economic independence. You ship on your own. Establish your own record. Because what the bank looks at is, who is this guy? Do we know him? Has he done this thing before? Is he an, uh, an obstacle? How do we help him? Okay, we have helped him for two years. He now has record. He knows what the starch consumers need in Italy. He knows what this, the market in Spain look, are looking for. That's how you develop a people. There is so much opportunity in fintech. A sensible government would begin to look at how to train our children. Those who say they don't want to continue. You provide skills for them at that rudimentary level. Those who are graduates already, you develop them into programmers. Government takes the initiative. A good percentage of them are going to end up working abroad or working for major Fortune 500 companies sitting here in Imo. But it takes a, a, a governor who is educated, who is proactive, who understands what needs to be done. You can't give what you don't have. Why would I worry about those before me? I'm worried about the future of our children. I'm worried about how to put Imo State back to work. My concern is how to develop human psychic infrastructure, human infrastructure. We need to stop all this rubbish going on with insecurity. And everybody says, oh, you have to call uh, Brigadier this, call Colonel that, call uh, Commissioner of Police this. No, you have to go to the foundation. What led these young men to criminality? What percentage of them are outright criminals? What percentage of them are agitators? What's their motive? What's their takeaway? How many of them are approachable? You remove those who are criminals for proper uh, handling. And then those you can salvage, you begin to salvage. You create opportunity for them to be what they can only envision. Not that a, a guy comes out of secondary school and he sees his mate who is the, who becomes the PA to a governor or SA to a governor. And this was a dollar that you probably didn't graduate properly. All of a sudden, his SA, you, he's now building one two place at Akanchawa. Before you turn around, he's building at a Concord extension. And the guy is sitting down there. He can barely find food to eat. He's watching his old mother that has been feeding him forever cry. It gets to a point, he says, to hell with all, all, with all of this. Whatever will be, let it be. I'm ready to die. Somebody once told me a story of a kid that told him that he was prepared to go commit crime. If he gets caught and they'll kill him, better for him. So this is what a responsible government must address. If your child is hungry, find out why your child is hungry. Address the hunger. Don't chastise him. You say, bah, 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 bah. Why are you hungry? Why didn't you eat now? When you... Okay, your mother didn't cook food. There's no food. Hey, uh... Okay, chere, 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 chere. I have small granite, young but I did not. Your mother will come back from market in the next two hours. Take, drink small water. The probability is high that that child will not leave the house to go look for something to steal elsewhere. Or if a child comes back, oh, I don't have food, and, uh, and you, chase, you chase him away with Cain. You have chased him into the wilderness to go look at uh, Mama Mary's shop or uh, Papa Fide's uh, uh, 
uh, restaurant and steal something from them. I don't condone stealing. I don't condone evil. I don't condone crimes. But we must, as responsible leaders, find out what is driving these young men and women into what they do and see the ones that we can address. And that's what a responsible governor will do. Why wouldn't you talk to? Are you are you are you dumb? Are you deaf? You must talk to people. What are you afraid of? If every negotiation fails, then you get into the next level of uh, activity. But you must talk. Every war ends on the table. Every war ends on the table. I don't believe that uh, somebody has done something bad. Uh, and the solution is go there and shoot him down. Talk first. Look for solution. And there's been no time in human history that you have sincerely and genuinely looked for solution. And people know that you have genuinely looked for solution, that you didn't walk away with something. That's my thinking. If you read my 2007 agenda, you see what I called my plan for the Southeast. The heart of Igbo land. We take a lot of insults. Every so often people say, go back to your, to your state. Go back to your state. Go back to Southeast. It is because we, they know that we are challenged here. It is because they know we have not been able to put our act together. If I know you have a house now that is very comfortable and all that, would I be chasing you out of my house? If I open my mouth, you pack your bag and uh, quickly go back to your house, which is equally as good, if not better than mine. But if I know that... Uh, you are an irresponsible man who has not been able to put your house in order. I can tell you anything. In the Southeast, you have quality conglomerate of the best brains, the most industrious people in the world. I told you earlier that if you drop an Igbo man on this granite, he will germinate. We are those people that leave our home, go into sit in a desert, begin to clear the, the, the place, and in seven days we have water. Go into the forest, clear it, we have light. We build towns, communities from nothing. We industrialize people's homes from nothing. We are the children and grandchildren of those who were given 20 naira to start life in 1970, which means that we have incredible capacity. All we need to do is remove our selfishness and our greed. We are not the most corrupt people. Remove our selfishness and our greed. What we have built all over the world, we built in the Southeast. And it's very simple. Identify what each senatorial zone in the Southeast has in terms of natural and uh, natural resources. What type of commerce each zone is interested in. Develop cells, economic cells in those places geared towards full development. As we develop the infrastructure, we develop the human, the human capital that is there. We create a common rail line linking our, our towns. Consumer confidence is very high. Yeah. There are over 49 million people that live in the Southeast. Consumer confidence is very high because we know how to trade, we know how to make money, we know how to create money. And we are not afraid to venture into new, conquer new space. Economically, I mean. 
develop proper health care. Look at today, we spend, this country spends 2 billion US dollars on health tourism to India, only India I'm talking about to. Most northerners go to uh, Egypt, to Saudi Arabia, UAE. Most people from Southwest go to London, go to South Africa. The bulk of these $2 billion is spent by people from South, South, South East. If you go to places like in, in, uh, Amandabag Hospital, the people you see there, you see people speaking Hebrew as if they are in a Ogumabili way. So, what does it take for us to develop in each of our five states special hospitals? Enugu could be a hospital that specializes in endocrinology. Anambra could be a cardiological hospital. It is not a place you go to, they tell you the heart of the size of the heart of a man's heart is the size of the clenched fist. No, if you get there, they will tell you why your heart is swollen. What is wrong with your bicuspid valves? Why do you have calcium? Why do you have calcification in your heart? They will explain that to you. Why are these arteries blocked? What things can be done to clean out these arteries? Do you need stents? Do you need uh, pacemakers? So they explain it to you. If the organ that is being addressed is your eye, for instance, they are not going to tell you that you have glaucoma and you then you move away like a, a bingo. They will explain to you what glaucoma is. The filtration, what is blocking the filtration at the back of your retina. What is damaging the optic nerves? When they get damaged, do you have any chance of reproducing, regenerating them? It's not enough. Our people are, are advanced. Then you come to Imo. You have hospital that specializes in urology, in nephrology, in oncology. You know, there's a department that is just cancer. Everything, as you've um, alluded to, boils down to leadership. Now, the question to you, sir, who is going to build the cards? Are you willing to step up as the governor to coordinate this within the greater Igbo nation. If I'm governor of Imo State, I can tell you that this process will not cost the state government for one penny. This is all private sector initiative. I'm trying to build a hospital like this in Enugu. The UNTH, UNTH has cut out about 45 uh, hectares of land for this project. For me, personal private initiative. You don't have to. You must know what you are doing. You must know where the monies are, where to find them, people to partner with. But when the people know that you are corrupt as a governor, if they bring that in, you are asking them, what is my share? If we build these hospitals, uh, what percentage are you going to give to me? You begin to negotiate for your personal interest. And so the people say, bug off, this man is a criminal. Uh, for the Obidati campaign, you were made the coordinator for Imo State. And in my research, I found out that uh, within a very short period of time, by the time you were made the coordinator, Imo State's Labour Party had about 4,000 plus members. But within a short while, you've been able to grow that numbers to uh, numbers around 500,000 and over 500,000. How did you achieve that within that short period of time? Motivation. Motivation. Every day I wake up and I see what this guy, enigmatic guy, called Pitopi, what this guy has done, what he has transformed this country politically, economically, socially into. Even if I'm sleeping, I wake up, I say to myself, there got to be a way we can help this guy. There got to be a way. I was a little guy the other day that they were rejecting.
some people even rejected to make him VP. And out of his own God-given wisdom, he said, no, I'm not going to be VP to anybody. I'm going to be on the ballot. Something that nobody would have believed would amount to anything. I read quite a lot. I've never had, read, seen anybody put together this massive human appeal. Remember October 1st in 56 countries worldwide people were campaigning out in the streets rooting for this guy. So there's no way you wouldn't support a guy like that. Yes, when I became uh, uh, PCC coordinator of him, the first thing I did, I went to the party secretary, played my loyalty to the chairman, state chairman, and the state working committee, and told them that I have a, a different approach to doing business, political business. I grew Abga from nothing. Abga was nothing, zero, zero, zero. I took Ab Abga, grew Abga into the real force in Imo State. Use Abga to get myself elected governor. Use Abga to elect people like Christian Anyamu governor. I mean, uh, senator. Use Abga to win 26 House of Assembly members and some House of Reps. Till they started their, the normal thing that we are known for in this country. So, I know how to grow a political party and process. I said to them, we are not going to have directors. I'm not here for to appoint coordinators, this, that, that. We don't have time to waste. I, Martina Abbaso, I am not in charge of Imo State. I am not in charge of Oweri North. I am not in charge of Emekuku Ward 1. I am in charge of the polling booth in Chifobi Memorial Primary School, which is where I vote. It's called Pulling Boot 1A, 104A. I'm going to be there. What my approach is, I need 200 man per boot. If you only have 4,186 people as membership of the party, and we have 2.2 million registered people in Imo State, and we are going to chase 1.5, 1.6 million votes for Peter. Yeah, it's not going to be done by these 4,000 people. Let's go to our boots. There is no time for a long grammar. Let's go to our boots. If you have 200 people working with you with their PVCs, that means we are going to wake up on election day with already 986,000 people counted. In the back, and those were the type of numbers I was expecting. I didn't. I don't know how they suppressed it, but that's the story for another day. So, the motivation, as I said, came from watching this young man beat his head against the wall. I hear that he went to bed by 4 a.m. I hear that he's on the plane by 7 a.m. heading to the next town. There's no way you want to support him, especially when you know he means well. He means well for this country. And he's selfless. He's not looking to steal a penny. I've had people call him names. I've had people call him all kinds of things. One bingo, excuse my French, said to me, why did this demand uh, uh, save money? Did we tell him to save money? And I told him, so you respect people who stole the money. <laughs> You would have preferred that he stole the money than saving it for a number of people. So there's no way you can find such a leader and not be motivated to fight, to do your best. Nigerian politics will never be the same again. The political weight of Peter, if it is P2B, if it is 500 kg today, in the coming months and years ahead, it will grow to 10,000 kg.
Obedient movement has come to stay. Obedient movement has come to stay. I came out with him on Friday at the campaign office. I went there for, for something else. While we were standing there, he wanted to get into his car. I wanted to get, get into my car to start heading to the airport. The building next door is a school, kindergarten school. The children were shouting from the window. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Mr. President. God bless Mr. President. Man, I was moved to tears. These kids are like four years, five years, seven years. Those are the little kids. Uh, Chief Martin Abasso, thank you very much for having me. And thank you for taking your time to allow this interview to hold. I'm most grateful. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. And uh, let me establish my gratitude that you came all the way from uh, Abuja, am I correct, to do this interview. I'm usually publicity shy. I don't give interviews. But uh, after I spoke with you, I said, why not? And my beautiful wife over there was around. I said, well, my might as well do it. Thank you very much. You're welcome.